Uh, Joey is the chairman of Judd B, vice chair of the Medicaid committee as well. Now we got your red light on. How you doing this morning, Senator? Good morning, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, definitely. So uh, let, let's talk first of all about how things have gone so far in this session. We're very <laughs> very early into it and already a lot of things getting accomplished over there. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, you typically in normal years, we start off sort of slowly by filing bills. And then we're in the period right now, starting uh, really Monday when the filing deadline ended, you would typically have about two weeks worth of committee meeting after committee meeting and not a lot of floor activity. But as you said, this year, we're still doing all of that. We have met our filing deadline and we are now doing committee meetings. But the House and the Senate have really turned out some pretty significant legislation, both chambers, of course, having accomplished the congressional redistricting, which was very important and necessary because the qualifying periods for those races have already started and will close, I think, on March the 1st. So it's a fairly short window. And, of course, our congressmen and any candidates who want to become a congressman or woman would need to know the district lines that he or she would be running in. So that piece of business, very important, has already been accomplished in the first, you know, two weeks. And then, of course, the House has passed very significant legislation on teacher pay increases, as well as, you know, income tax reform in Mississippi. We in the Senate have passed a very significant piece of legislation dealing with medical marijuana. So I think both chambers have really gotten off with a bang, really. And, you know, where all this ends, no one really knows yet. But I definitely think uh, the legislative session is well underway. Well, and I think partially because of the, the pandemic years and the craziness of the session two years ago, uh, there there was some pent up energy, for lack of a better term, and a lot of things that had built and had built during the off session time. So it's it's somewhat rare, but you guys were just ready to go out of the gate as Absolutely. soon as you gaveled in. Yeah, and as as your listeners um, are well informed and know, there had been a lot of talk about even special sessions this past fall. Of course, they never came to fruition. So again, there was a lot of pent up energy thinking that maybe we were going to have been already working on some of these bills, uh, in particular the, the medical marijuana bill uh, and others. And then that didn't happen, so you had sort of that a real thrust going into the very first early days of session where people were ready to get stuff done. Well, let, let's take some things in order, and starting with the one that you guys have already dealt with, the medical marijuana issue. And we, this has been talked about at great length by everyone, but we know it was the will of the people. We know it's what they wanted. You guys have passed it through, but one thing jumped out at me, and I'm just curious, and maybe you can help me understand this. What's wrong with grams? Why do we have to come up with our own term for the amount that everybody gets? The Mississippi, what is it, Mississippi Medical Cannabis Equivalency Unit. What, yeah. what was the purpose of that? Well, I think the purpose of that is a great question, and I asked the same one. And it's because you have so many different varieties now. You have infused products like edibles. Grams don't really have the same impact or correlation to you know, a brownie or something like that, because you're not talking about the gram of the actual food itself. You're talking about the uh, the THC levels and things of that nature. You also have, of course, the, the flower that they refer to, which is the smokable type. And you have the, um, what is the other one, the infused products and uh, the liquid form. So it, it doesn't all, it's not the same type of um, ingredient, I guess you'd say, or uh, our medium for the product to be um, consumed or taken in in whatever form it is. So you had to have sort of a definition, whether you were buying a, an edible, a gummy, or you were actually smoking the product to know what is the level that's uh, permissible under the new law that you can consume. Okay, that makes sense. Sure. I, I, when I saw that, I was like, we, we have grams. I don't understand that, but that you made it make sense. Sure. Now. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Uh, the, the, the question, though, is, uh, well, and a couple of things. Number one, you just mentioned talking about smoking it. Now, is mm -hmm. that allowed in, in this bill? In the Senate version of the bill, of course, it, it's only passed the Senate. Now it goes to the House and then presumably onto the governor. So I'm only speaking of the current iteration of it that left the Senate last Thursday. Um, yeah, there would be uh, restrictions, uh, heavy restrictions placed on this. It's only for, um, you know, a, a list 
of pre-approved um, disabilities or, or diseases uh, that a doctor or a healthcare professional, be it a nurse practitioner, a physician, an optometrist, there's a whole list of who is eligible to write the prescription and for what, you know, cause that prescription is to be written. This is not you know, an adult use program. Now, in, in all honesty, in many states, um, that's the way it started. You know, it started as a medical cannabis program, and then over the time, it became and morphed into a, an adult use program. And certainly, I, I wouldn't want to see that happen here in Mississippi. Uh, and there are some who would, of course, and they're quite open about that. But this um, particular version of the bill, if it stays as it is, there are limits. You have to have an, a face-to-face like you are doing right now, not a teledoc type situation, but a bona fide legitimate appointment with a living, breathing person across the table or desk from each other. And you have to agree in your medical opinion that I have one of these debilitating medical conditions for which uh, you know cannabis could, in fact, be helpful to relieving pain. For instance, you know, cancer. That's one of the issues we all think about. If you have a relative like that, you know, my father um, two years ago had pancreatic cancer. It was a very serious issue. Thank God, you know, miraculously he is doing very well and has recovered. But very few people can say that with that type of cancer. So it truly is a miracle. I'm thankful for all our friends who prayed for him. Uh, He's doing well, but there are a lot of people that would not be doing so well and would need some sort of pain relief from severe you know, illnesses and and pain, and that's the nature and the thrust of this bill. Well, I tell you what, we're up against a break, as you can hear. When we come back, Senator Joey Fillingane, we still have a lot to talk about. I'm here whenever you need me. Uh, Okay, well, he's not leaving (laughs) until 9, Perez. Just go ahead. We'll we'll just set Douglas down next to him at 8 and just continue on. It'll work out perfectly. Senator Joey Fillingane, we will continue with him on The Gallo Show next. I see Dave Hughes in. For Paul and in studio with us, Senator Joey Fillingane, uh, we were talking about the medical marijuana bill before the break. Do you think the House is going to have their own version or at least some some things to, to change or add to it and then it comes back to you? You know, that's a distinct possibility. They've been working on it as well. I know um, Representative, uh, former Senator Yancey has been working alongside of Senator Blackwell Um, hand in glove. So I know they've been a party to the same meetings and hearings that we've had in the Senate, which um, were very informative, to be quite honest. We heard from people from Utah and and, Colorado, all the various states that have different iterations of uh, medical and adult use programs to kind of find out how they went about doing it, the pitfalls that they've discovered along the way to try to learn from them. And the, the The term earlier I was trying to remember was concentrate. So you have a 3.5 gram of flour, which is a smokable product, the one gram of the concentrate or the 100 milligram of infused THC um, that you put like in edibles and gummies and those sorts of things. So um, we'll see what the House does. I'm never trying to second guess what our our fellow House members will do on the other end of the chamber, but I know they'll be thoughtful about it. And if they don't change it, of course, it goes straight to the governor as is. If they do make changes, then it would come back to the Senate for us to concur and invite conference. Well, I know the governor has said he's not particularly happy, I don't think, with the with the level yeah. that people are allowed to have. Do you think that's going to factor into any of this? It could very well. I mean, I have great respect for Governor Reeves, and he and his team have looked at it. They think, um, based on what I've heard um, here on Super Talk and other places, that uh, that limit should have been somewhat lower on the per month um, you know, availability of that. I guess the difference comes in when you're looking at this as a medical, you know, medicine type product. You know, why would we overly regulate the amount that the doctor or the physician and his or her client or the patient would need to in, in, ingest over a period of time? You know, we're not doctors. So um, I think we put like really tall ceilings on that, but we would depend in our bill on the physician to regulate the amount needed, you know, maybe different for a cancer patient versus a glaucoma patient, you know. So, you know, do we really want to tightly regulate how much they can take or not? And we're not doctors, at least most of us aren't. There there are a few medical professionals in the legislature, but I am not one of them. So I would not feel, you know, equipped to say, oh, for this patient, you can only have this much, but for that patient, you may need three times that amount. You know? Another thing that uh, Governor Reeves has come out and said, he's, he still wants some tweaking on it, is the movement to remove the state income tax. Yes. Are, are we going to get over these these bumps and cut down my tax bill? 
Yeah. I'm asking for me at this point, Senator. <laughs> you know, I hope so. We're all taxpayers. I know I pay uh, quite a, a bit myself. I think where we all want to get to, hopefully, is that we want to have an overall reduction in the income tax. You know, other states have been able to accomplish that, albeit through other means. I mean, Texas has all these severance taxes. Florida, Tennessee have a ton of tourism income that we simply don't have. So, you know, not every state is created equally or similarly, and we have to take what we have and make sure that it works long term. I do hope in the Senate version of the tax reform bill that we will see a tax reduction without any accompanying tax increases. I think the only criticism at this point that I I could find broadly with the House proposed bill, and I give them great credit for trying to tackle this issue, it's it's a needed discussion and debate that we need to have, but it's in some ways smoke and mirrors. You can't raise one tax and then eliminate or reduce another and call it an overall tax cut. It's sort of a tax swap. And if you're going to be serious about reducing taxes for hardworking Mississippians, I think we need to arrive at a final solution that actually is a tax reduction without any, you know, behind the scenes increases in other taxes. So does that mean we can reduce totally the income tax in Mississippi? Maybe or maybe not long term. But could we reduce it? Could we eliminate maybe the 4 percent bracket and maybe some of the other taxes that Mississippians have to bear, like car tags or grocery sales taxes? Maybe we can look at something like that without then turning around and raising a sales tax on the back end and try to pat ourselves on the back end and think we've done something. Now, one thing that I had heard in the midst of all this discussion is about cutting the car tags in half. And I I wonder if there's going to be some confusion there when people get their tag Mm -hmm. bill after that goes into effect saying that it does, just assuming here. Because that's going to cut the state portion. That's not going to cut anything for city taxes, county taxes, school exactly. district taxes, or all of that. So when, when that is said, it is going to be a reduction in your car tag, but it's not going to cut it in half. Yeah, it, it would probably not cut it in half. And you're on point in that in car tag taxes in Mississippi, there's a, a large portion of that tax that is a local tax. So an ad valorem tax that you help pay for your school districts, for instance, through that. Um, It's a property tax assessed by the locals. Um, And if you're in a city, then there's an extra tax on top of the county tax in many cases. So what we would be able to do would be to reduce or eliminate the state portion of the tag tax, if, if you want to call it that. And we could certainly reduce or eliminate all of the state portion, and that would not... Um, totally do away with your tax that you pay when you purchase a tag because the vast majority of taxes, probably close to 80 percent of the tax that you pay on your car tag is assessed by, you know, your county and or city if you live in a city, jurisdictional limit. So, yeah, you're exactly right. We could do our portion and the citizens would just have to know that the state legislature has reduced or eliminated any portion or all of even the state portion of that tag tax, but that will not touch the local tax. I just wanted to clarify that because some of the reporting that I have seen said uh, they've cut your tag in half. And I'm like, no, they haven't. Mm -mm. you got to look at that rundown. Yeah, you'd have to check with your supervisor (laughs) in order to get it cut in half or eliminated, yes. Uh, Now, you mentioned uh, something earlier, just as a a side comment, which leads to another question. Uh, When we were talking about the medical marijuana Mm -hmm. and said, you know, there are some people I'm sure that would like that. That brings up to my mind the entire problem of the referendum process, yes. uh, which currently doesn't exist in Mississippi. True. Uh, are the talks ongoing? Are we going to get that fixed in this session? I certainly hope so. We need to do that uh, desperately. That is a mechanism that not everyone loves, obviously, because you know many legislators would love for them to have total power and not have a back end run around the legislature that the initiative provides. But, you know, I think back, we would probably, it would have been a lot longer to get voter ID, for instance. You know, I was very involved and filed that petition, uh, initial referendum, you know, many years ago because the legislature, which was partially controlled by Democrats at the time, simply refused to take that issue up. I mean, it was just a non starter with our Democratic friends who controlled the House at that time. So, We have voter ID, and we had it much sooner than we otherwise would have gotten it 
because of the existence of initiative and referendum. So there are certain issues that I think um, the only way we would get, uh, certainly as soon as we would get them, comes from the voter ID option. And so we need to have it. Now, I appreciate that you don't need to put everything in the state constitution. That's for me, doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. Um, most things do need to be statutorily based, and so I have no problem with, you know, modifying the initial referendum process in some ways to make sure that it works and it still exists, but that it doesn't screw up our Constitution every time, you know, there's uh, an initiative filed. So uh, I certainly hope we can get that done. We need to get that done, and I think the voters are going to demand that we get that done. Uh, has there been any talk? Has anything been oh, proposed? For sure. There are lots of talks, and I've heard interviews of the speaker and the lieutenant governor are are negotiating with each other. They're visiting. They're talking to the Constitution Committee of folks in each chamber. So I definitely hope that we get something like that done. But I think what you'll see will be a change from what we had earlier in that it probably won't be uh, directly placed into the state constitution as the previous one was, it will probably more of a statutorily based law, which I think is reasonable. I, I think that's a better option because, sure. again, and we've we've talked this into the ground, I know, but it, when you put it in the state constitution, if you look up next year and go, wait, wait, there should be a comma there. Well, we have to have another vote. Absolutely. To put a comma in. That, yeah. That's a bit much in terms of a living piece of state law that is going to have to change no matter what subject it's on sooner sure. or later. because technology changes. I mean, technology is changing so fast that what we pass today is going to have to be updated probably in the next couple of years because there'll be new products. There'll be new iterations of the product, and we will have to be able to regulate those things. So if you play something like that in the Constitution, every time a change happens, you have to go back and you know hold a constitutional vote and referendum and redo it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not really manageable. But we do need that option, and I'm very strongly in favor of having an active voter initiative and referendum process. Uh, we're coming up on the break here. Can you stick around for just a couple Absolutely. of minutes? Absolutely. Thank you. He's got nothing else to do. It's not like the, the legislature's <laughs> in session or anything. Uh, you guys gavel in. What time today? Uh, we go in at 10, but there are committee meetings that start before that at 9. Okay. So we, we'll try not to make you late for that. <laughs> just a couple you. of more minutes because i got to find out, are you going to fix the pecan law problem? Oh, of course. We were Sounds talking good. about that during the break. Yeah, As you can tell, he's enthused. Uh, we do have a couple of more things to talk about with Senator Joey Fillingame. We'll do that next on The Gallo Show. Keep it here. Welcome back. Dave Hughes filling in for Paul on The Gallo Show, live in the Trustmark Bank studio. Senator Joey Fillingame in studio with us. Had someone, and, and the governor, uh, well, you know, was on with Paul yesterday, and yes. they talked about this. Somebody on the text line wants to know your opinion. Would you uh, fall in to line with it to go ahead and cancel daylight savings time? Yeah, I don't think it's that important. There we go. <laughs> well, you do have a lot of big things that you're dealing with. Yeah, I'm but, okay with doing away with it, sure. Yeah, it's, it's it's not doing any good. Yeah, it just confuses folks. Well, and it, it no longer serves the purpose it was originally designed. Can I have some daylight, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> Stay in your box. <laughs> okay. we, we'll raise the blind and let you see the sun later today. You're welcome. Uh, now, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about is uh, the Dobbs case, the, uh, which everybody in America is talking about right, right. now. Absolutely. Uh, and it has brought a lot of attention. There, there's a lot of discussion. And, of course, everyone wants to know right now what it's going to be. It's probably going to be this summer before we get a, a ruling on that. Typically, yeah. The um, Supreme Court, you know, there's term ends around the end of June. And they tend to, although they don't have to, but they tend to save their more controversial decisions and opinions for the latter couple of weeks of the term, which would be towards the end of June. Um, we're very hopeful and very prayerful. I know our um, Solicitor General, Mr. Stewart, did a fantastic job. I hope everyone had a chance to listen live like I did, um, you know, uh, via the Internet, of course. Um, but if not, it's, it's saved. You can go listen to it. He did a fantastic job. So credit to him and General Fitch for the hard work and the great briefing and oral argument they did. But we certainly hope that um, that the Supreme Court, at least the majority of justices, will take this opportunity to roll back a decade of killing of unborn children 
and that they'll use this moment in time to protect, you know, countless millions of children and Americans going forward. So we're very prayerful, very hopeful. They did a fantastic job. So now we just have to be prayerful and, uh, you know, ask everybody that's listening who agrees with, with the cause of life like I do and I know y'all do um, to pray hard that the at least five of the non-justices will have the courage to do what is the right thing, in, in my opinion, and, um, you know, leave it to the states. So at least each state like Mississippi will have the option of protecting unborn life. Well, and that's been the argument all along. It's a state rights, a sure. state's rights issue. Absolutely. Uh, and shouldn't be a federally mandated issue uh, at any level. But uh, that's been the reality we've been dealing with since the 70s. And this would yeah. be a major change. Oh, it would be a sea change and, and one for the better. And I think that was evident in the arguments. I mean, the liberal justices were railing against Mississippi's audacity of saying, are you telling us that we've been wrong for, you know, 48 years? And Mr. Stewart, you know, quite like said, yeah, basically, yeah, y'all have been wrong, and you've been wrong before in the court's history, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, any number of, of major decisions where courts for years had said, you know, minorities aren't, you know, full voting citizens and shouldn't be counted as such, shouldn't be considered, you know, equal. Uh, we had to change that. That was wrong. And at some point, the court had to take um, the courageous step and say, look, we were wrong for however many decades. We need to do the same thing on this Roe and Casey decision. It has been wrong, and it's been wrong for a really long time, and it's really a stain on, on America's history. And we need to, to recognize that, to be honest about that, and to change and move forward in a better direction. Uh, it's interesting that uh, despite the fact that they continue to talk about Mississippi all over the country as being so backwards and in last place, and we seem to keep coming up at the forefront of these things. You know, and, and the Lord works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. And, and I think it's a, an honor. I know um, the Priest for Life organization, even this week, um, are honoring several of the legislators who were involved in that 15-week um, case in, in D.C. in the March going up, but I know Senator Angela Hill and Representative Becky Curry and myself have been invited to come. Uh, and so the country, I only say that to say, your, underscore your point, that the country is recognizing that Mississippi is a leader in this cause for life, along with Texas. Obviously, they've gotten a lot of, of notoriety and attention uh, on their five-week ban and that is already in effect. I mean, it just goes to show you that the the sky doesn't fall, the world doesn't end. Um, you know, in Texas right now, the Supreme Court has allowed their five-week abortion ban to stand intact for the last several months. And, you know, the world hasn't come to an end. You know, children are being saved, you know, and, and people are learning how to deal with that. So we can already see a glimpse of the post-row world in Texas right now. And it's not so bad. You know, it actually is a good thing. And so I hope that um, Mississippi can continue to be a, a, a leader in the cause for life and other causes in our country. It's not such a bad place. And, and we have good news coming out of Mississippi. I'm back home. We just had an announcement that FedEx is opening a new distribution center. The Jones Company is opening a $40 million headquarters in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I think great things are happening in our state. And I think God's blessing us. And we just have to keep helping them happen in any way we can. Senator Amen. Joey Fillingain, always enjoy having you in here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hopefully it won't be so long between now and the next time we talk. <laughs> I haven't talked to you in forever, I it know, seems like. I but. know. Well, hopefully everyone stays safe during this, this winter storm coming. Shh. You're going to get paralyzed.